motivated this, uh, this, this, uh, this first encounter, now she might be more motivated to try it again some other time. Okay? He now knows that he's got to figure out um, how to manage uh, two simultaneous dating relationships. Okay? Um, uh, and all that. So he's been changed by this interaction. People are not passive in these interactions. They're actively engaged. They're actively changing all the time. And what has to happen is that each of these participants in the social interaction has to keep track of the changes going on in the other ones. Okay? Or at least try to make some inferences about the changes that are going on uh, in, the, in the other ones. Okay, so that's the general idea behind the general social interaction cycle. Okay, so uh, again, when you think about social interactions, think about how they, they, they fit into this framework. And I think you'll find, as many of us as many of us have done, that it's a pretty good framework uh, for thinking about uh, these things. We will get back later to your your, uh, your very interesting question about how much of this is going on consciously and how much of this is going on unconsciously and automatically. Uh, there's going to, the short answer is there's a mix. Okay, uh, and exactly uh, whether the mix favors um, unconscious automatic processes or more conscious deliberate processes is going to depend a lot on um, uh, on the precise circumstances in which the thing takes place. When you're asking somebody out for kind of blindly for a date, that's probably pretty conscious stuff. Okay. Uh, if you're an old married couple, you've been together for 40 years or something like that, you want to go out for Friday night, um, that's probably a little bit more automatic, right? but it's going to depend. Okay, another important um, construct that we're going to uh, pay a lot of attention to in this course also comes from Robert K. Merton. He's a pretty busy guy, um, and it's the, it's the notion of the self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, which Merton talked about in the, uh, in the 1940s, mostly. Um, but uh, again, what you can see in this, in this extended quotation from Merton is the cognitive point of view on social interaction uh, written in the book. Definitions of the situation. Remember the Thomas theorem. Merton loved the Thomas theorem. Definitions of the situation become an integral part of the situation and thus affect subsequent developments. And then he goes on to talk about what happens depending on whether the definition of the situation is an accurate one or an inaccurate one. And what's especially interesting, uh, at least for, for Merton, is what happens when the definition of the situation is false. That is inaccurate uh, in some way. The self-fulfilling prophecy is, in the beginning, a false definition of the situation, evoking a new behavior which makes the originally false conception come true. Notice how much of the person's situation interaction is wrapped up in that single phrase. The definition of the situation matters. The definition leads to behavior, and the behavior changes the situation so that it more closely comports with the originally false definition of the situation. Okay? The specious validity of the self-fulfilling prophecy perpetuates a reign of error. For the prophet will cite the actual course of events as proof that he was right from the very beginning. Such are the perversities of social logic. What Merton's talking about here is you've got an idea in your head about what the situation is. You behave in accordance with that idea. You change the situation so that it more closely conforms to that idea. You say, oh, my idea was right all along. I knew, uh, I, I knew what was going on. That is what's known as, um, as a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's important to notice, uh, to, to understand, that prophecies don't have to be false in order to be self-fulfilling. Gabriel Salomon, uh, an Israeli educational psychologist, uh, has uh, talked about what he calls the self-sustaining uh, prophecy. Uh, and there, uh, his, point, his simple point is, the definition, leads to the definition of the situation leads to behavior regardless of whether that definition is true or false. Okay? But when the definition is false, a correct characterization of the situation, that also has behavioral consequences. Because in the self-sustaining prophecy, the definition of the situation leads to behavior that keeps the situation where it is. Okay? Doesn't allow it to change or evolve or uh, migrate to something else. Uh, it, might, uh, it might intensify its characteristics, uh, but whatever it is, it keeps it the way it is, keeps it uh, from changing. In either way, the definition of the situation leads to behavior that brings or keeps the situation in line with the definition. It's the definition that matters, not the objective, uh, not the objective situation. Yes? Yeah, um, let's, let, let, let's take a classroom situation. Uh, suppose you, you're, you know, you're a teacher in a classroom, uh, and you really like to teach the subject, and you're really looking forward to it, right? Uh, maybe the kids in the classroom, they're not all on the same wavelength uh, as, uh, as you are, but if you think the topic is important, and you think the topic is interesting, you're gonna behave as if the topic is important and interesting, and you might actually make it more interesting and important to the kids in the classroom. So that's not a false definition, okay? It's a more or less correct definition of the situation, right? Uh, but it's, you're, gonna, you're gonna work to make the classroom more interesting, uh, the lecture more fun, or something like that, um, uh, uh, as opposed to doing something else. Where most of, uh, most people didn't notice this Salomon thing, uh, I, we were colleagues for a while, which is how I know about it, um, um, uh, but uh, most of the work on this has, has uh, been on the self-fulfilling prophecy where the original definition is false, and that's where this literature comes from. There was some other question here. Yes? Oh, okay. That's, that's good. Next time, we're going to talk. I'm going to show you an experiment uh, on that. But what happens uh, really is what boils down to what uh, the University of Texas psychologist Bill Swan calls the battle of wills, okay? uh, where I've got one definition of the situation, you've got another definition of the situation, and there's going to be, at the very least, a negotiation uh, 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 between us. But um, many of the problems that we have in social interactions come from the fact that the two people, stick with the dyad, the two people uh, in, in the situation have different definitions of the situation to begin with. Okay? Um, I used to be involved in some sleep research, uh, and uh, one of the stories that comes out of sleep laboratories is the subject comes in, you put the electrodes on them, you put them in the bed, you say, okay, now you want to go to sleep, and you want to record the changes in brain waves that the person goes to sleep. All right, I'll go to sleep, and um, he, uh, he just doesn't go to sleep, right? So you go back into the, into the, into the bedroom, and you say, uh, uh, okay, now it's time for you to go to sleep. Uh, and the subject says, okay, I'll go to sleep. And half an hour goes by, you're wasting all this time, and the subject still isn't asleep. Oh, time to go to sleep now, okay. Still doesn't go to sleep. Then you go and say, why aren't you sleeping, okay? And the subject, this is apparently a true story, says, you mean a mouse in this room isn't supposed to be there, right? They each had a different definition of the situation, okay? Uh, one that's more familiar to you, I think, will be the concept of a study date, okay? When two people come together for a study date, it's almost certainly the case that one of them thinks they're going to study, and the other one thinks they're going to date, all right? <laughs> And what's going to happen is that there's going to be some kind of negotiation that goes on between the two of them, um, uh, uh, or, or it's just not going to work out, right? Or, 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 or it's going to go badly. So again, the, the diagnosing, the diagnosing that interaction is going to begin with finding out how each of those individuals define the situation. It's very important in any kind of social interaction that both of you be on the same page of the prayer book. Um, that, that, that kind of 
together about the goals and kind of what's going to happen. Otherwise, you got to start out with this negotiation process. Right? Okay, so now let's look at a famous example of the, of the self-fulfilling prophecy, which is known as the Pygmalion in the Classroom um, uh, 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 research by Robert Rosenthal and Lenore uh, Jacobson, famous experiment published in the late 1960s, based on uh, Rosenthal's earlier work on a phenomenon known, known as experimenter bias. What Rosenthal had noticed in his, in his earlier work is that when experimenters were aware of the experimenters in psychological uh, experiments uh, were aware of the hypothesis, hypothesis being tested, they were uh, very likely to treat the subjects in the experiments in such a way as to confirm the hypothesis. Okay, that's, no, that's called experimenter bias. And there are ways to get around that. One way is to keep the experimenter blind to what the hypothesis is. There are other ways to do it uh, as, uh, as, as well. But the, uh, the experimenter bias effect, uh, which uh, Rosenthal documented in a huge number of different uh, kinds of contexts, uh, was, uh, was quite a discovery in the, uh, in the 1960s, precisely because before then, before Orn, before Rosenthal, most psychological experimenters thought that they were doing something like chemistry. Okay? Where you take a chemical and you pour it into a beaker, and you take another chemical and you pour it into a beaker, and this thing, uh, this, this, this reaction happens. They thought that uh, the people in their experiments also weren't thinking, also weren't trying to figure out what's going on, also weren't trying to figure out what to do in this very strange kind of social encounter known as the psychological experiment. Well, what Rosenthal did was to say, gee, let's look at this kind of experimenter bias effect in a kind of larger real world situation. And what he and Jacobson did was to go into a set of uh, 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 public schools uh, uh, and um, and uh, say, well, we're researchers, and we're, uh, uh, we're educational researchers, and we've developed this new test. Uh, it's a test that we can give to elementary school pupils and to identify those children who may not be doing very well now, but who are going to do spectacularly well in the future. These are known as intellectual late bloomers. Okay? These are, uh, we're famous experimenters. We're going to, we've got this test we want to try out in your classroom. And in return for participating in this experiment, we'll tell you who the kids are that we've identified as intellectual late bloomers. That's payback. Okay? So now what happened was they gave this little pretest, and it was just a basic IQ test. It wasn't anything special. Uh, and then ostensibly on the basis of this pretest, they identified a random 20% of kids in each classroom from grades 1 through grade 6 uh, as intellectual late bloomers. Bloomers, gave the names of the teachers and went on their merry way. Later on in the school year, towards the end of the school year, they gave an IQ retest to the uh, to these students. Uh, and what they discovered was that the average kid in, uh, in each of the classes did show a gain in IQ from the beginning of school to the end of school. School does actually make you smarter. Um, but what they discovered was that the gains were especially large in the children who had been identified as intellectual late bloomers. Okay. Now remember the point here is it was a random group of kids. None of them were actually intellectual late bloomers, or all of them were intellectual late bloomers, but it was 20% of those kids who had been identified as such uh, to the teachers. Apparently, something happened between the fall of the academic year, when the kids were identified to the uh, teachers, and the spring of the academic year, when the, uh, the testing took place, to produce greater gains in intellectual ability in IQ for the late bloomers uh, compared uh, to the controls. This, these are the actual results uh, from the experiments. Uh, this is for all subjects. You can see in the green, uh, there's greater IQ gain for the uh, late bloomers than for the, uh, for the controls, uh, and for the littlest kids, kids in first and second grade, the, the, uh, the gains were especially profound. This is known as the Pygmalion in the Classroom experiment. Those of you who have taken a, who know a little bit of Greek mythology know the story of Pygmalion and Galatea. Uh, Pygmalion was a sculptor uh, who hated women, um, and uh, at one point he uh, created a sculpture of a woman and fell in love with it. Uh, I thought, oh, this, is, this woman is really the woman for me, uh, but what he did was to fall in love with his own creation. Right? And here, the, uh, the, the, the IQ gains were the teacher's own creation. Somehow, they were a creation of something that went on between the teachers and this random 20% of, uh, of kids. Now, this is a very, 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 um, uh, this was at the time a very, very controversial study, less controversial uh, now, uh, but the effects were actually quite large. Here we have a summary from uh, uh, Robert Rosenthal and David Rubin of uh, several hundred studies of experimenter bias and Pygmalion in the classroom uh, effects, all of which showed that expectations uh, created uh, sort of to create behavior. Here, for example, are um, uh, some uh, experiments involving Rorschach ink plots, where uh, the experimenter was told, well, I think the subject you're going to be working with is, uh, is, is kind of neurotic. Uh, and what would happen is the subject would uh, uh, be scored as getting a lot of neurotic responses to the Rorschach ink plots. Even in animal learning experiments, if you were told that you're a rat, that you were running, this is back in the days when college sophomores actually got their own little white rat to run uh, in experiments. We don't do this anymore. But a typical experiment, you'd tell one group of, 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 of students that you're, you're going to be working with a bunch of rats who have been bred to be maize bright. And another group of, uh, of students were told, you're going to be working with a group of rat, uh, rats who have been bred to be maize dull. And lo and behold, the maize bright rats ran the maize faster, learned the maize quicker than the uh, maize uh, dull uh, rats uh, did, and so on and so forth. These real world uh, situations, everyday situations, almost all of them are classroom experiments. Almost all of them are variants on the Pygmalion study where a teacher was told that some kids were especially promising students and other kids were just ordinary students. Yeah? Yes, that's exactly what comes next. Because what do they do? You know, what do these teachers do in order to bring out this intellectual late blooming in these kids who are just ordinary kids, right? Well, Rosenthal did, in fact, Rosenthal and Jacobson did, in fact, uh, uh, analyze this. But you got this, you got this uh, the model that you've got to think about. So teachers develop expectations. They're told that Johnny is an intellectual late bloomer, uh, and then the students react to this. But students can't react just to the expectations because that's inside the, the, the teacher's head, right? Somehow, the teacher's expectations have to translate into behaviors that then have their effect on the students. And Rosenthal and Jacobson uh, identified four particular differences between the, uh, the way the teachers treated the intellectual late bloomers and the way they treated the other kids, even in the same uh, classroom. So for example, um, the, uh, the, the teachers created a different socio-emotional climate for the late bloomers than for the other kids. They were just nicer to them. You know? They greet them they greet them individually when they came into the class. They could say goodbye to them individually uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the end of the, uh, of the school day and so on. So it was just, just nicer to the kids. Right? They also gave the late bloomers more feedback on their classroom work. Whereas they grade everybody's quizzes, they might go to the kids and say, well, you got item 13 wrong and item 15 wrong. You might want to work on your long division or whatever. So the late bloomers got more feedback from the teachers than the non-late bloomers did. Uh, there were changes in, uh, in input, for example. The, uh, the teachers would give the, um, the intellectual late bloomers more and more challenging work to do. They'd give them extra assignments. Uh, they'd give them uh, uh, extra credit projects or whatever that led them to have a richer uh, academic environment uh, than the other kids. And then uh,
Yugoslavia, Jimmy. Tommy, do you know? Okay, so that you don't give this kid any chance, right? Oh, you know, starts with Z, you know, remember, you know, uh, um, and uh, so the, the, the more encouraging output, they made the kids smarter. They made the kids smarter by virtue of these kinds of behavioral manipulations. The teachers did something to change the classroom for those kids, okay? But um, the origins of this behavior um, were in the teachers' minds, were in the teachers' beliefs and expectations about the children they were teaching. That is the essence of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Beliefs changing reality, okay? And and uh, 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 people, targets, having to respond to that change in reality, okay? So the mechanisms, mechanisms always through some overt behavior on the part of the, of the teacher, but that overt behavior has its origins in the teacher's beliefs, knowledge, and expectations. That's the essence of the self-fulfilling prophecy. And what's important about the self-fulfilling prophecy is not whether it's powerful or weak or whether you can do something about it. The importance of the self-fulfilling prophecy in this context is it shows how cognitions, definitions of the situation, can affect the behavior that occurs in that situation. We'll talk more about this on Monday. Have a good weekend. See you then.